welcome everyone. This is our fourth discussion, number 404, on the wonderful text put together by Dr. Harris, H.J. Harris, the author's pen, Noom de la Plume, pen name. And the title of the work, of course, is Solving the Race Issue in America. And it's a very timely work in lieu of our current set of social circumstances. Uh, we're living during a time of a pandemic. Um, there was a presidential debate last night, and there were a lot of issues on the table. Uh, Dr. Harris has taken us through three discussions to date, and we wanted to say welcome to you, Dr. Harris, before we give a presentation based on last week's discussion. Welcome, Dr. Harris. Well, thank you so much. My pleasure, man. I can hardly wait to uh, get here, and I'm looking forward to this evening. Excellent, excellent. And welcome everyone. And again, just Dr. Harris, will we give them an introduction based on last week's discussion and then go into an introduction of our guest? Or do you prefer to introduce our guest and then get into the discussion? Well, you know, last time I think it was really good. Uh, we had a number of people sort of do a quick round robin of yes. just, you know, who they were and what they did. And I think that would be a great idea briefly, uh, just who you are and what you do. and then we'll go on with our, our recap from last week. Wonderful. Sherry Rogers' his name comes up. Yes. Would you care, would you care to <laughs> introduce yourself? Hi, how are you? We're can well you in your know? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. We see, we see your name as well. Okay, great. <laughs> Hi. You. Hi there. It's great to be back. Absolutely. And uh, just introduce yourself, if you will, as the movie maker. Oh, okay. I'm uh, Dr. Sherry Rogers. I'm a clinical psychologist, but I also am a producer and director of the film Shared Legacies on the African American Jewish Historical Coalition. Excellent. And who shall we have next to introduce themselves? Let's see. Uh... Well, Pat and Rob, you were not here before, so why don't you introduce yourselves? So we're Pat and Rob. We um, are recent transplants to Texas, and we're both retired. And our church is doing a lot of um, racial studying, I guess, I would say. And this is one of the things we chose to do. Excellent. Thank you for your continued outreach. Mm -hmm. Next, Mrs. Sandra. Yes. Dr. Dr. Sandra, yes, ma'am. Sandra Spalding Hughes, retired professor from NC State in the area of family and consumer sciences. Also, I have a second retired from the North Carolina General Assembly. And uh, presently, I co partnership with Dr. Herbert Harris and Life Skill Institute. Excellent. Excellent. Let's see there are additional names here. Miss Ruby, Dr. Ruby Bray. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. I am a retired military officer and college professor, specialty leadership. And I currently serve as a business consultant and a coach for primarily persons who are completing their dissertation research. And I live in Wilmington, North Carolina. Excellent. Welcome, welcome. Uh, this uh, is Thurman, Thurman Williams. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. We can see your name as well. Okay. Uh, I'm, uh, re I'm retired from uh, real estate and investment banking. I'm currently a lifelong learner, and I have read most of uh, Dr. Harris's books, <laughs> The Golden Twelve and... <laughs> <laughs> wow. Welcome, Thurman. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Mrs. Kim Smith. Yes, good evening. Greetings to everyone. My name is Kim Davy Smith. I am the benefit specialist and, and administrative assistant for Every Dot Black. We are a company that helps to bring on entrepreneurs and help to promote them in our email blasts, on our mastermind meetings. And it's basically a strategy of networking and technology and I just joined my brother company, Jimmy Davies, uh, a few months ago. Excited to be here and excited to get started on this conference call this evening. Excellent. Welcome. It's so good to have you. 
uh, Susan Backstrom. Hello, I'm Susan Backstrom. I'm living in Chelsea, Massachusetts. I am uh, on the Chelsea Disability Commission and uh, I am uh, I'm willing to put my strength behind anything that, that improves the lives of, of people of different ethnicities and races and stuff. We have a, a very diverse city that I live in. It's incredible and, and just want to pull 100% behind, you know, what, what everyone is doing. Great. Excellent, excellent. So glad to have you. Um, Mr. Jimmy Davis. Sure. Good, good evening. Uh, yeah, my name is Jimmy Davies and I'm the founder of Every.Black. And uh, like my sister said, what we do is support entrepreneurs by using technology and a strategy of global networking. So I attended last week. I had to get off early for another meeting, but I'm back again. I really enjoyed what I did here. Thank you. Excellent. Welcome back. Uh, Ms. Naomi Otis, please. Hello, my name is Naomi. I am a, a master's in social work student here in Tennessee, and I'm excited to be here and learn some more tonight. Thank you. Excellent. Welcome back. Uh, Sherry Roger, uh, McKin McKinley Sims, please. Hi there. Uh, I'm Reverend McKinley. I serve a small church here in Philadelphia. I'm originally from Texas, and uh, I'm not sure how I found you, Dr. Harris, or how I got to be here, but I've been listening in the past few weeks, and it's been uh, lovely. My congregation is about 40% Black, and as a white minister <laughs> here in Philadelphia, uh, I'm always learning. So, Thank grateful you. for it. Excellent. Excellent. I'm so glad to have you. And I think, Dr. Harris, that may be everyone for now. Oh, we have Addie, Addie Banks. Yes. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Uh, I have attended each session and I have uh, learned a great deal. And I hope that there will be an opportunity for us to continue to dialogue. I have gotten in into the Black history research and Mr. Jimmy Davies allowed me to have a radio show about uh, black business success. And so uh, I expanded my knowledge, but also my ability to present. And that's why we're talking tonight, because we all have to learn what is especially needful, the history of Black Americans, before we can understand uh, the race relations issue. But uh, I have also um, established a network, Let's Talk Race Now, with a website, letstalkracenow.com. I encourage you to look at that because I have presented race relations discussions uh, from the news because that's where once we wrap our heads around and get grounded in the issues, then we are able to solve the race problem. And let me, as I close, thank you for your candid remarks, because as you share, we all grow. Thank you. Wow. Thank you so much. Okay. Well, that was interesting. That's always good. I love to, uh, yes, Debbie, go right ahead. Hi, I just wanted to introduce myself, Debbie Smith. I live here in Wilmington, North Carolina. And uh, it was the, I'm the chairperson of the Wilmington Jewish Film Festival. And we screened Shared Legacy, which was uh, Sherry's, which is Sherry Rogers' film, and that's how I got to know uh, Sherry by that uh, by doing that. And also, uh, Dr. Harris had a chance to see it and reached out to me, and, and now I've gotten to know him and started to meet many of you. 
and just look forward to continuing to learn more about uh, this topic. All right, beautiful, thank you. All right, so we've gotten everybody. Last week, let me tell you, last week we had uh, one of the most, I, I call it an exciting session uh, with Dr. Uh, Dr. Rogers, we got Dr. Rogers and Dr. Rogers, the Dr. Sherry Rogers uh, shared uh, shared legacy, her film. And so I wondered, you know, everybody sees things differently, but if there were any comments about last week's session that anyone that would love to make any uh, insight they gained from it, any uh, additions, any questions about it before we move on to the next uh, portion. We're in a room full of leaders and speakers. Anyone feel free to speak up. <laughs> Any questions about last week or impressions or feedback? We know that you've been on a few Zooms in between then and now, but just recall the wonderful conversation we had and feel free to share with us. Well, while you're thinking about it, maybe Sherry, Shari, maybe just uh, what you got from, I think, the the conversation and just the vibrations that we all created last week maybe you could have a little thought on that well i thought first of all i'm so grateful for this discussion i mean just entering into this discussion just having different people from different states all caring about discussing race is just such an honor and um my organization spill the honey we have a college kids who created a newsletter which is very exciting and we included this um, webinar from last week on the newsletter so that the college students across America could, could enjoy it and hear about it. But what's neat about our newsletter is we create special dates, both in the black history and the Jewish history that we include on the newsletter and special people and what's going on today. We had Brianna, we had of course Brianna, when the, what happened with uh, the the um, what happened with her and um, we had um, uh, a, an amazing woman whose mother uh, Alexis Scott whose mother contributed to American history she just passed away and um, her her um, husband was one of the uh, only black photographers at Buchenwald um, which was in Buchenwald in Nazi Germany. So not only was he fighting for freedom in America, but when he was over um, in Germany, he was taking pictures as one of the soldiers. Um, and his family also started the Atlanta World newspaper, which was one of the first black newspapers. Mm -hmm. So it's just amazing, you know, all these connections and, um, and, and this idea of sharing our history and seeing how one event in history contributed to the others. I think an important, um, Mr. Dr. Harris and I were talking briefly how many of the um, many of the professors from Nazi Germany couldn't couldn't find jobs. And of course, they had a they were immigrants from Germany to America, and they couldn't get jobs as Jews in any of the colleges. And the African American um, HBCU colleges would accept the Jewish professors when they couldn't get a job anywhere else. So a lot of very important um, student-teacher relationships developed from that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rogers. Dr. Bray, I had a conversation today with Dr. Monroe, yeah. one of your colleagues, and he was yeah. sharing that with me. You know, he had worked in the uh, in the Martin administration in North Carolina, he was like a deputy commissioner of education in the Martin years. And uh, as one of the, he's been president of probably four or five different uh, historically black colleges. And he was sharing a whole piece on that night. I'm gonna put him in touch with Dr. Rogers and uh, carry that discussion further because it's something I'd never heard before. We, we were just going over some points and when he shared that with me, I'm like, man, I didn't know that. You know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. Any other feedback on last week? Well, just a connection that you and I talked about, Dr. Harris. When I was a, um, a student up at Howard University pursuing my graduate degree, among the many stellar scholars that I in, encountered, uh, Dr. Jane Flack, educated, Yale-educated, 
a Jewish woman, in fact, was a theory professor. And um, I was so enamored with the information that I became a political theorist. So these connections we find in our own lives as well, if we look uh, close enough. All right. Mm -hmm. What was her name, Dr. Rogers? Uh, Dr. Jane Flax, and she's an a internationally known um, theorist who now teaches, she's retired from Howard, and she teaches one course over at American University. Right. And if I could just add that in my research and, and study, that uh, during Reconstruction, Jewish instructors came into the South during that period as well, and helped build and, um, you know, HBCUs. And also, uh, we all know about the Rosenwald schools that uh, with Booker T. Washington. So the relationship has, has been strong and consistent. Mm -hmm. In, in fact, Angela Davis, who we most of us know from the 60s and the 70s and her cases um, before the court of law, as well as her being a philosophy professor at UCLA at a very young age, um, her favorite professor and his favorite student was Angela Davis's Dr. Herbert Marcusa. And uh, Herbert Marcusa is um, a, a well-renowned, again, philosopher, who said that Angela Davis was his, his favorite student because she understood that philosophy was not this kind of dead subject matter, but it's, it's, it's a way to think, it's a way to see the world, it's a way to engage. And she takes the work into real life and examines society in a very critical analytical manner. So these contributions, again, if we just simply look close enough, we see that they are woven throughout African-American and, and Jewish history. Yes. Mm. Wow. All right, any other thoughts on that before we move on? Okay. I mean, that's, a, that's a whole nother area we gotta go into because <laughs> I've been learning, you know, just, I went, I took my daughter on a tour of HBCUs. And one of the things when we got to Fisk University I had always assumed that Fisk, Fisk is a historically black college. It started in the 1800s, shortly after the Civil War. Mm -hmm. And for the first about 40, 50 years, most of the instructors were black. I'm sorry, were white. You know, when I was looking at the different pictures, I was amazed. And Fisk didn't actually have a black president until about 1946. Mm -hmm. So it was uh, interesting, you know, uh, that I really was not aware of, and it's something we need to maybe look into in the future because, uh, it, you know, the pictures tell the story. Right. So uh, making a transition here, our goal tonight is to talk about where we go from here. We've shared so much profound information. And one of the things that I have, that has always gotten my attention is the fact that you can't fix something if you don't face it. And one of the real challenges that in dealing with uh, solving the race issue is so many people have no idea of what the issue really is, number one, or how deeply it is embedded in this country. Uh, let me just try to give myself a little, uh, okay, just to, but in looking into that, you know, doing a, a bit of research, one of the things that amazed me that this issue that we're dealing with here is so deeply engraved in the fabric of America that when we look back at the Civil War, we always, there's a whole history of the Civil War and a whole feeling about it. But when I looked at the statistics, the issue of slavery was so profound that over 620,000 Americans died in the Civil War. 620,000. And I compared that. 400,000 died in World War II. 116,000 died in 
World War I, 58,000 died in the Vietnam War. And so more people died in the Civil War than World War I, World War II, and the Vietnam War together. And I give those statistics to say that this, this feeling, this, this paradigm that was embedded in the very creation of this country is so strongly embedded that when we talk of going forward, where do we go from here? We must understand how big this thing is, how big this, this, this task is. And not only how big it is, it's like a, a we were in South Carolina and there's a, an oak tree down there that's over 400 years old. And its roots, its roots literally, its roots literally cover almost an acre. And when you think about it, when we look at America and the dynamics that we are facing right now, we have to look at the roots and how deep did they go and how embedded it is in the psyche and in the consciousness of America. And so in that context, in that context, in that context, we now begin to look forward at how do we solve this race issue in America? Where do we go from here? And one of the interesting things, the last book that Dr. Martin Luther King wrote was called, Where Do We Go From Here? And Dr. Rogers and I were discussing it a little earlier, and maybe Dr. Rogers, you could kind of share some feedback from that because it's amazing, you know, we're, we're here all together looking at this issue and Dr. King years ago had also dealt with it. And so Dr. Rogers, maybe you can share a little about the uh, Dr. King's book. Work. Thank you, thank you. So um, the work by Dr. King, Where Do We Go From Here, Chaos or Community, was in fact his fourth and final book written during his lifetime. Uh, later books came out of his papers. Of course, Stanford University is still cultivating information out of his papers. Morehouse um, College in Atlanta, where he graduated from, has his papers as well. So he was very intellectually productive, but this was a time when he sat quietly in the midst of really the civil rights movement. It was written in 1967, toward the end. And in the work, he really addresses this notion of uh, black power in the civil rights movement and the juxtaposition amongst the two. And so he talks about how the civil rights uh, movement and SCLC's role in it and the Southern Christian Leadership Conference was comprised of religious and spiritual leaders. And they felt in many ways that the Christian program should be made into public policy, that the Christian program should be brought to Congress, and that as an element of the teachings of SCLC and the practices, that violence really had no place. This was when, of course, Dr. King was moving toward the anti-Vietnam War stance and the notion that um, America cannot engage in violence abroad or away and not do so in the other venue, if you will, that we're a consistent nation. So he was really challenging the powers that be. And in the, in the work, he really addresses the economic issue. And this is at the heart of his work, which is why the Poor People's Campaign was his final campaign in his lifetime. And it was this notion that there's so much spending, of course, on military and on perpetrating violence literally across the globe, that the resources are not there to provide a safety net for society. And so Dr. King took on the view that there needed to be a social safety net, an economic safety net in lieu of, uh, similar to the social security for elders, that there needed to be a bottom under which no one fell in society. And so with that, Dr. Um, Harris, I'll turn it back over to you. Mm, yeah, that's uh, very interesting. Thanks so much, Doc. And yes, sir. Back in, uh, I got so many uh, buttons to push here. Has anyone else had any uh, feedback on that? Any thoughts on uh, 
I don't know if you're familiar with that work, uh, Dr. King's. Yeah, I had uh, I had looked at um, seen some information about it, but I had not really studied it. But it takes us to the point that when we look at where we are right now and where we're going to be, where we want to go, economics is going to be critical. And I think that's what Dr. King saw. And if we look back, uh, let's just say to date, so much of the transformation in our country has been, you might say, cloaked in moralistic or religious terms, but the real motivation was economic. For example, the uh, bus boycott. If we think back in the 60s, in the bus boycott with Rosa Parks, the bus boycott lasted a year. And it was not that the, peop the citizens of that town had a moral revelation. <laughs> you know, they didn't go up to the mountain and get clarity. <laughs> but they changed their way of doing business because they were losing money. And so economics, you know, any solution of going forward that does not embody economics, that's why, Jimmy, the work that you all are doing, the entrepreneurship, any work that does not involve that might be on, on, on uh, sinking sand. Mm -hmm. Even when we progress, so here, the economic um, reality brought about a positive social change. But then Dr. Rogers was sharing something with me about, if you remember when affirmative action came about, that there was the case in California, I think it was, that basically put the brakes on affirmative action. And maybe Dr. Rogers, you could share a little bit about the reasoning behind that case. It was, once again, it was not a moral recapitulation that like, no, we, we don't want to continue writing this wrong. But once again, it was an economic uh, Thrust. motivator. So, Thrust. Rogers, um, some, some of you may remember a Proposition 209 in California, and uh, it was headed up by Ward Connolly and the intention was to remove affirmative action from college and university entrance in the University of California universities, UCLA, UC Berkeley, and the like. And Ward Connolly was actually employed as a lobbyist on behalf of the uh, companies that paved highways in California. And in order to address this notion that there was a, um, a California set aside program, affirmative action program, economically on the billions of dollars in play in order to pay California's highways, his strategy was to attack affirmative action in the higher education. And from higher education, one of those pillars that Dr. Harris talks about um, would come this down trickle, if you will, of ending affirmative action in business practices as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So once again, that, that economic piece is, uh, is so strong that it, uh, it seems that our morals are very often economically driven. Uh, we were talking earlier, I had a, a conversation with my daughter, we did a podcast and I was remembering the days of the 50s and the 60s. And the fact that integration was a right thing. In other words, the Supreme Court said that you could no longer segregate the schools and the Department of Commerce extended that, that you can't segregate on public transportation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But in the back of all of that was a economic calculation that the businesses of the, we'll call it the majority businesses, when they looked at integration, they recognized it was a bad thing at, at segregation, but they then recognized also that there was a major economic piece of the country that they had le literally left on the table. So when I was a kid, there were black cab companies because white cabs wouldn't ride you. There were black restaurants because 
restaurants wouldn't serve you. There were black hotels because you couldn't stay at the white hotels. There were black funeral homes because no, no self-respecting funeral home is going to bury a black man. And so literally there was an entire economic infrastructure that had developed out of necessity. My aunt showed me a building. She said, when I was a kid, now my aunt died at 93 about five or six years ago. She said, when I was a kid, that was the black bank. Wow. We're, we're talking, <laughs> you know, we're talking the thirties. I had no idea there was a black bank. She says, oh no, Mr. And Chief, Mr. Swindell, they, they had the bank there. And that was the, she said, because the, the white banks wouldn't loan money to people. My grandmother was a real estate speculator, but in North Carolina, we're talking the forties, a black person couldn't even buy land at a public auction. Wow. And so my grandmother connected up with a, an Englishman who had come to uh, North Carolina and he, I guess he came here as an Englishman with a great accent and he married one of the daughters of one of the founding families. <laughs> okay. And as a result, he, he would then got together with my grandmother who ran a seamstress business. You notice right now, you can't even get a pair of pants him. <laughs> but my grandmother had a, a, a very prosperous seamstress business and through this man, this Englishman, she bought properties at auctions and she owned over eight houses and wow. ran them as rooming houses, boarding houses as they call them. Wow. Mm. So as a result of segregation, there were black construction companies. Jimmy, you know, down in Atlanta, we were down at the, um, uh, ooh, we visited his house, one of the early black millionaires. But there was an entire infrastructure of business from you know vertical integration from from making shoes on up to growing corn and integration literally wiped that out and i don't know that anybody saw it at the time i think that all of us i know as a young person living through that i was just so happy to be integrated i you know i like i said i i believe that we all thought that white ice was colder than black ice you know that the white ice cream tastes better than the, the chocolate ice cream. <laughs> but that paradigm eliminated an entire inf economic infrastructure, which has never been recreated. And so now we're at this point in time and space where that infrastructure is gone. You can, most of the black tradesmen have now died out and the trades have not been carried for, further. And so this is, once again, it sounded like a good thing morally, you know, justice, integration, but economically, it destroyed an entire economy. Mm. Any thoughts on that, or questions, or feedback, or maybe other impressions? Feel free to unmute yourselves. Dr. Harris. Yes. Since you have made it very um, clear and that there is an economic level to race relations and what I call repair, because the repairs that are needed from integration and separate but equal, so are you suggesting that an economic solution where we go from here might include reparations? Well, let me just take that from a spiritual point of view, okay? Reparations, as if I looked at the problem, reparations might be if you took a basketball and held it up to the light and you see the shadow on the ground reparations might be the shadow okay that the challenge is not and and only because reparations tend to have a financial uh, connotation to it not that it's bad but that the challenge is much bigger uh, and i like to look at the spiritual concept of atonement which is a, to me, a bigger picture. Atonement 
is how do I make things right? Reparations is kind of a, a concept where if we've been wrong, let me give you a check. Because if the mind and if the consciousness is not right, I don't care how much money anybody was given, in short order, it would go back pretty much where it came from. So reparations is an aspect of it, but it's a much bigger picture of atonement. How do we make it right? So things like affirmative action was a, 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 a very un rudimentary attempt to make it right. So I hope that answers your question, Addy. And if I may, Dr. Harris, just um, the eight steps of atonement uh, include one, point out the wrong, two, acknowledge the wrong, three, confess fault, four, repentance, five, atonement means we must be willing to do something in expiration, in this case of our sins. Uh, six is forgiveness, means to cease to feel offense and resentment against another and to ask for forgiveness. Seven is reconciliation and restoration, and eight is perfect union with God, mm. the eight steps of atonement. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful, Doc. Yeah. So I hope does that kind of put context to your question, Addie? So, yes, thank you very much. Yeah, welcome. So more, uh, more like, um, more like <clears throat> establishing, establishing the <clears throat> the whole economic uh, economy, basically the whole the whole structure uh, that was that was uh, organized around you know helping black people get get through life, um, establish that again and and make that a, a reality right now. Uh, yeah, thank you, Susan. And it, and that can be a part of it. Once again, you know that sometimes you have a, a challenge that's so big, but that can be a, a, a part of it. A, a part of it is to, when we talk about restore, how do you really restore that? Those people are gone. <laughs> many of the skill, you know, th there's so many things that are missing now. For, for example, the skill sets. When I was a child, you had to take trades. <laughs> I mean, you had to learn how to fix something, knock something, nail something, wire something, build, sew something. And so even if you did not have a college degree, even if you didn't graduate from high school, you had a skill to do something. Those skills now have been lost. So it's, it, money is important, but it's a whole, it's a much bigger picture of how to make it right. But thank you so much, Susan. That was great input. Yeah, how do we make it right? Any other thoughts on this? Uh, yes, Dr. Harris, this is uh, Jimmy Davies in Durham. And uh, something that comes to my mind is that in South Africa, for several years, they had a truth commission mm. where they just literally talked about things uh, in communities. And just my personal opinion that, that uh, we as a nation, you know, there's pockets and things that you're doing here, I think is great. But as a nation, have we really talked about it? I think that the young folks really doing these, the uh, drawing attention over the last several months, I think that's a great thing because it's actually getting people to talk about it and people are thinking about it. So even though I'm, I'm really for an, um, develop or I guess eliminating that economic gap through entrepreneurship, personally, I think the first step is you gotta have that discussion. Mm -hmm. Uh, honest discussion, like we, like you're doing on this this series, I uh, wish uh, we were doing this around the country. And and one last thing, I just want to applaud the pastor out of Philadelphia that has a, a mixed congregation, uh, mm -hmm. because they say on on Sunday mornings that we're the most segregated on Sunday mornings. Mm -hmm. And so I just want to, I think he's still on the call. I hope he yeah, is. McKinley, I wanna, yes. Uh -huh. I want to uh, think that's what that that's great because there's no no white heaven and black heaven. <laughs> so why can't we learn how to, to do it here on earth? So yeah. those, those are my comments. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much, Jimmy. Yeah. Yeah. That's, uh, yeah, that's uh, some powerful stuff there. The, um, this, this economic piece is so critical to everything that 
when we start going forward, let me just back up a minute. Jimmy, you said something really powerful. That Truth Commission, I remember watching that. You know, some of those hearings. Right. And, and you know, in going forward, I think a part of this idea of where do we go from here is to start researching and see what else has worked. I mean, we're not the first people to go through uh, this transformation. I mean, if you go back, you had the Pharaoh and the Jews. Uh, you, I mean, we're not the first person to go through this this uh, bondage to freedom transformation, you know, injustice to justice transformation. And so I think one of the pillars might be to really look at what's, what's going on in other places, look at things that have worked elsewhere. And when you said that Truth Commission, I had actually forgotten about it. But I remember listening to those, to some of those hearings, and it, it was amazing. I mean, when and you know that, and the idea was, look, it, it happened, but you know, nobody's going to be punished. But you got to tell what you did. You got to say it exactly the way how you felt it, what was going on, and and in that we can bring about you know some type of redemption, some type of going forward. And if I'm I, I, I the, the the name of the commission was actually the truth and Reconciliation Commission. Mm. So there was, again, one of the steps of atonement, the reconciliation element as well. Mm. And, and just to, to also piggyback on that, you know, we're still, I'm still learning things about Black history that I didn't know. Mm -hmm. Things are still popping up. So how can we even have that discussion unless we really admit or really look at what has happened so we can have that on this discussion if, uh, yeah. if if i'm still learning about things that are, that are not in the, our quote unquote history books then i know there's a lot of other folks too that just don't know yes yes this sounds like a good time for me to throw in the personal plug yes Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> i have a podcast started it last November. It's on patreon.com. It is no K N O W black history. And you can join for $5 a month, but you will land on just hundreds of posts on 30 or more subjects that will teach you black history. Yes. yes, thank you. Thank you so much, Addie. You, you know, when you said reconciliation, Jimmy, I, I thought back, Debbie, were you in Wilmington when we had the 1898, uh, um, the, the centennial 1898 um, period? I wasn't. I wasn't oh, here. Okay. Will you hear Dr. Bray? Yes. Yeah. Okay, your speaker's not on. Yeah. The uh, one of the things- I do believe. Yeah. Yes. And, and that was called the reconciliation. You know, and, and I think a part of it that made it, and I'll say work, you know, I won't value judge it, but was that people fessed up to the fact of the truth of the situation. So, so Hugh McCray, who was one of the signers of the White Declaration of Independence, was able to sit down with Bertha Todd, who was a black woman who was a school teacher. And, you know, they were able to basically come together. And so some of the things that have been happening, uh, they just changed the name of Hugh McCray Park, uh, kind of a, as a, recapitulation to, to the grandfather's connection to the 1898 um, really coup. Mm -hmm. And but a part of that being able to happen now, I know 25 years ago, I, I doubt that I thought that would have happened, but that reconciliation period here in Wilmington helped a lot. And so I, I, all of us here, as we go out and we conclude this portion, uh, uh, when we conclude this fourth uh, discussion, I think all of us here should possibly look at ways that can be done, that, that this idea of truth and reconciliation is an important truth to keep in mind, that as long as people deny, 
I think I opened, I said, if you don't face it, you can't fix it. That's and I awesome. think, yeah. In the, in the Jewish religion, we just had Yom Kippur, mm -hmm. which is basically about this whole idea of atonement. And first you have to apologize to your, any family or friends that you might have hurt their feelings or, or did some kind of harm. And that was a sort of atonement. But I, I want to say that I'm part of a commission um, that is looking to raise $10 million for the Greenwood District in Tulsa. Um, this, was a, um, this was a thriving uh, Black business district. It was called the Black Wall Street. And in June of 1921, it was completely demolished. The whole Black uh, Wall Street was demolished. And there's a group yep. of very influential people looking to rebuild this uh, Black Wall Street and uh, Reverend Sharpton's involved and a whole bunch of different folks are involved and I'm part of a, a group that's looking to rebuild this um, district. And if anybody's interested in getting involved, I can connect you to the uh, heads of it. But it's, it's kind of cool because it basically is showing the empowerment of the black community during this time. Oh. Uh, Dr. Rogers, this is Jimmy Davies again. I had to speak up. Our family actually w was in Tulsa at that time. My father's family, wow. my father happened to leave and uh, join the service. But after that, he lost track of his family. And one of the things I've always wanted to do is find out if I could get any information about my branch of the family at that time. We lost, lost track of whatever family members were there at the time. So well, I would like I'd to, be happy to introduce you to the, the head would, person of this and maybe you want to get on the committee. I definitely part would. Part of yeah. this whole, you know, um, endeavor to help rebuild this, this community. I, yeah. I definitely would like to do that. And my sister, wow. she's on the call too. Oh, yeah. yeah. I, I would like to as well because it haunts me and I sometimes find myself just trying to find some sort of connection that my father had. I know he was uh, in Tulsa during that time. We kind of, me and Jimmy talked about it and know that, you know, uh, that he migrated to Chicago and then went off to the war. So it's, it's, a, it's a link that we need to really make connection with. And I just wanted to also add that, you know, Jimmy, we have roots in North Carolina as well as our grandfather came from North Carolina, was a brick mason, had his own company. Uh, and this was right before, what, 1930? Because I know my mom, they dealt with the the depression and all that was going on. So I just want to kind of add that we've got a lot of history of entrepreneurs in our family. And I really recognize that when another um, entrepreneur came on to our Every Dot Black Mastermind meeting and I'm thinking myself, oh my gosh, mm -hmm. there's the spirit of entrepreneurs in this family link. There you go. <laughs> and then we had cousins that owned a barbershop and now we're with every dot black, and I'm like, this is not anything that just normally happens. Yes, yes. Wow. And so I know we were talking about Dr. Herbert was talking about how do we get those skills back. I think some of it may be genetics, mm -hmm. or or what we've been taught along the way from our parents, our grandparents, that their history of being entrepreneurs and growing well. So just just as some hope. <laughs> yes. I would love to be a part of that as well, Sherry. Wonderful. Well, um, Dr. Harris, if you can connect me, then I'll connect oh, yes. and, group and you, to this, this building yeah, of walls can, back at Wall Street. You can count me in on that. You know? <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know, you just, you know, we often talk about conspiracy theories. And uh, in researching, I found some, uh, a group that was speaking and I sort of put some things together, but one of the things, you know, there's always this assumption. There's a spiritual, a spiritual duality. Wherever there's light, there's darkness. Wherever there's up, there's a down. And so when we look at some of the great strides that go forth, some of the great positive things that happen, it also creates uh, a, a possibility for the opposite thing to happen. And in looking at this whole body of research, as that it was talking that one of the things that the, and I'll call it the power structure, I'll call it the power estate. There's a, there's a portion of this country that is really always embedded. It's always been there. There's a power estate that's always there. And one of the things that the power estate learned from the civil rights era of the 50s and the 60s was that you didn't need education. 
that black people were literally working with good, uh, well, you, know, you might say well-intentioned white people, Jewish people, all people working together were able to do incredible things. And that you had this whole black economic infrastructure of tradesmen, plumbers, you know, black plumbers, electricians, etc. And in the 70s, there seemed to be a tendency, and we're going to, when we get to the end of the day, we're going to talk about this. Education has such an impact on education is like how the seed is chosen and cultured. And so in the 70s, if you look at the history of education, the trades were taken out of the schools. Mm -hmm. They have trade schools now, but you got to pay to go. In those days, when you finished high school, you knew enough about something to make a living. You could be a tailor, you could be a, a, a carpenter, a plumber, you could make a living. <laughs> Rob, you're shaking your head. <laughs> yep, that's right. Yeah. And so that's part of institutional and systemic racism. Not only were the trades taken out of schools, but the trades were made such that you had to be able to perform to a certain standard. That standard allowed you to join a union. Only in a union could you then be able to do work on certain jobs where codes were set by cities that were controlled by people who had no interest in ever seeing African-American business people be able to get established and survive. Yes. That's how the commitment to set aside came about to be able to create a space for those persons who have the skills and businesses to be able to have opportunity. Otherwise they'd never be able to successfully compete. Not never be able, but it we're would, often Yes. <laughs> eliminated and not allowed to be able to compete. Yes, yes. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Bray. This, this whole line of, uh, of thought came, so the 70s, the trades were removed. The 80s, and once you have trades, people can't make a living. In the 80s, drugs like crack cocaine were really introduced mm -hmm. into the neighborhoods, okay? So now people were either getting high because they were upset and depressed or they start to sell drugs as a means of income because the others had dried up. Okay. Yep. Then you had the 90s that came along with uh, structured sentencing, the, the legal, the, 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 the judiciary aspect where people got sent to jail for like incredible periods of time over this drug thing that you'd literally put into the community. And when we look at the, remember the, the COINTELPRO, that whole, piece of bringing drugs into the black communities in order to finance wars in foreign countries that you weren't authorized to be doing. So then we had to sent the uh, structured sentencing. In 2000, that was the introduction of the faith-based initiative. And one of the core foundations of racial justice, if you, when we talked about Dr. King, remember it was, Southern Christian Leadership Council, Congress, which was a group of ministers, black, white ministers working together. In, the, in this whole um, faith-based initiative, they put the tax aspect on the churches. And I watch churches who used to do things politically, who you know, now were afraid to get involved. <laughs> I mean, they, it has gone to a point in many of the black churches now where churches actually don't want politicians to come mm -hmm. and speak. And so we have, as Dr. Bray said, this, uh, there's a systemic structure. I don't know who's doing it, but it works out so, so productively that somebody's doing it. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. And so this brings us to where we are now, which is, and I guess we better sort of move to complete this which is, where do we go from here? There, there appear to be three aspects. Business, we've been talking about that. The business aspects, the economic aspects, the, the entrepreneurial aspects. They, because business is always at the forefront of change. You can't have a revolution unless you can finance a revolution, <laughs> okay? 
<laughs> Somebody's got to come. You know, one of the great things in, in doing a little research in the Jewish community, they, they, they put together some of the bail money to get people out of jail. And one of the, if I may, Dr. Harris, just join you here. One of the um, elements of Atlanta mm -hmm. was that when uh, Martin Luther King the Peace Prize and was honored with a dinner in Oslo, Norway, he came to Atlanta. Atlanta was not going to um, honor him. Dr. Rogers spoke of this from the, the spiritual perspective with the Jewish rabbi who supported him, but someone called the former CEO of Coca-Cola and the CEO, former CEO of Coca-Cola called everyone in Atlanta who had done business with Coca-Cola, who had benefited from Coca-Cola economically and said, we are not going to embarrass a citizen of Atlanta. We need you to buy tickets and everyone you know, and it was a thousand plate dinner in honor of Dr. King. So the role of corporate America entrepreneurship and corporate America, as we know, Coca-Cola sponsors so many Coca-Cola football classics at HBCU, Ingrid Saunders Jones headed up the Coca-Cola Foundation that would literally give $100,000 to the various um, conventions, national black conventions, et cetera, et cetera. So the role of corporate America cannot be um, understated in social justice. Yes, yes, good point, mm -hmm. Doc. So that is this, it's, a, it's, it's this three-legged stool, you might say. So you have that business, the corporate aspect, the entrepreneurship, the small businesses, the corporate. And if you notice now, the corporations are almost in the front of some of the social change issues. Mm -hmm. If you remember when uh, Colin Kaepernick was having some real challenges, Nike gave him kind of a, a path to follow. And so the corporations, I think, look at everything from a profit and loss situation, but they look at it, I think, if, 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 and in many instances, if everybody's not prospering, then sooner or later, nobody will be prospering. That poverty is like a, can be like a cancer. And when you have this huge discrepancy between the haves and the have-nots, it's just a matter of time before it all comes down. And so, the corporations, the, the business aspect is going to be one part of, of this, where do we go from here? Corporate initiatives, uh, entrepreneurial initiatives. The second aspect is the church, the religious community. Because, you know, our, our government is, in theory, created on a religious and spiritual foundation. And as uh, I know McKinley, Reverend Sims was saying earlier, he has an interesting church. And Reverend Sims, you probably have one of the few churches, one of the few in the country where you have a, a roughly a 50-50 white black uh, congregation. <laughs> they are very, very few. But that may be the model for the future. Mm -hmm. And so a part of uh, going forward is to really deal with the religious community. That's why many of us on this and who've been here for the last few weeks uh, are from the religious community because that is gonna be a powerful piece there of how the churches come together, how the religious people come together, how the spiritual people come together. The third aspect is government. And this is where we, where we are right now. The government part is really let's just say uh, exciting. <laughs> I don't want to cuss, so let's just say exciting. <laughs> but when we look at the government aspect, you have basically four parts of government, which is interesting, a little different twist. You have the executive gov part of government. If your leader is not on point, it changes the whole direction of the country. In our book on page 131, it talked about after President Lincoln had been assassinated, that the President Johnson took over and he was a staunch Southerner. And so now after 620,000 Americans died fighting a war, he decided, he attempted his own brand of presidential reconstruction creating a racist atmosphere at the highest levels of government. 
isn't that interesting? Wow. He handed out thousands of pardons to former Confederates in routine fashion. So normally when you have an insurrection, the people who, if they say the insurrectors, <laughs> normally get punished. Mm -hmm. But what he did was he handed out pardons and allowed the South to set up black codes, which are severe state laws that limit the freedom of former slaves and essentially maintain slavery under another name. Mm -hmm. So that's what a leader can do. Now, that was what, 1865. Most of the civil rights legislation, and this is where I'm to make this point. So that was the executive part of the government. But at that time, the legislative part of the government was, yes. Okay. I just said Congress. Yes, yes. The legislative Congress, at that time, they were able to pass bills, the Civil Rights Act of 1865, the, the, uh, the, all, that whole period, those amendments, but they were over Johnson's veto. Okay. So that's one of the really important things about the separation of, of powers, that even though the leader there had a, a, a racist attitude, the Congress at that time, okay, did not. When we progress up to today with just the recent events with the, the, the whole issue with the uh, disavowing of white supremacy, that now kind of casts a shadow on the executive branch that we have right now. But then the Congress that we have right now is not necessarily one that would override his veto. So everybody see the different dynamic we have right now. So that's why when we talk about protecting our government, this is so important that when you have one area overpower another, that's, that's, that, 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 that can lead to chaos. The third part of government, the, 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 the judiciary, is very interesting. It, kind of manifests the interests of the power estate. And so in 1857, the Supreme Court said um, in uh, the Dred Scott decision that, that, a, that a black man didn't have any rights that the courts were had to respect. Mm -hmm. In Plessy versus Ferguson in 1896, it said separate but equal was constitutional. Mm -hmm. And so when we look at the history from Johnson, his vetoes, his pardoning the Southern, the Confederates, you come up to 1876 with that whole Tilden election. And that was where an election fell into Congress. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> okay, history can repeat itself. When the election fell into Congress, deals were cut. And one of the main deals was to remove the troops from the South, which ended the reconstruction. Now the foundation that Johnson had put in place with pardoning the Confederates and the black codes now were able to operate with impunity. In 1898 in Wilmington, North Carolina, it came full circle with the White Declaration of Independence. And that, that vibration continued right up until 1954 with Brown versus the Board of Education. So the judiciary can change the country for years and years. And when we look at this battle right now with the Supreme Court, we have to look, be mindful of Plessy versus Ferguson, that court, uh, mindful of the, the court of uh, 1857, that if that mindset is perpetuated through a very conservative court, look at what can happen. Mm -hmm. So, Judiciary is the area we have to work on. The fourth area I put on the government is education because government is always funding education. It goes back to follow the money. And if the education system is not tweaked and worked and made whole, then that feeds everything else that creates the consciousness, that creates a group of young people who have good intent but no knowledge, no information. So just 
putting that all together. So where do we go from here? It's like we have to impact business. We have to impact the church. And we have to impact the government. Any feedback or thoughts on that? Makes me think of Marion uh, Marion Edelman, who was from Spelman, and she had to get Bobby Kennedy to actually see what was going on in Mississippi and the children there, and how the poverty there. And it took they didn't he didn't even believe it. It took her to like fight in front of the government for for them to come actually see what was going on for them to get involved and do something. Yeah. And sometimes that that just gets left apart, like. With all, with, with all the amazing stuff that's going on with the protests, I mean, working with the government, you know, is important in terms of getting on, on. Yes. Yeah. Any other thoughts or feedback? And, and Marion Wright Elderman's organization, the Children's Defense Fund, is still very active and still engaged, both with the government and with child-serving government agencies across the nation. Mm -hmm. So I, I have my, my thoughts about it, but I'll, I'll throw this out to the group. If we look at government and we say we need to go forth, we need to, where do we go next? Any ideas on things that we can do to impact the government? Things that we need to focus on. First, to vote and elect officials who will represent your interest. Two, to make sure that we are influencing policy. Policy that will affect what happens with money, with banks and lending. Policy associated with standards and regulations regarding commerce. Okay, very good. Voting policy, yes. Any other thoughts on this? how we need to approach, how we might look at impacting the government. Uh, Dr. Harris, I'm not sure what category this is fall under, but uh, just the topic of uh, technology, how that's changed everything. Mm. Uh, I don't know yep. where that might fit in. Well, it certainly fits in business, in, in, in the business arena, that's for sure. We can, because that's gonna change the economics and the business for the, for the, for the world. Yeah. So it's definitely there, yeah. And it's also impacting education. If you're looking right now at how children are receiving information during COVID, it's primarily through, you know, a, a laptop computer. And there are challenges with that because children that are kinesthetic, that learn by doing, by touching, that feeling, they're having a difficult time. And there are various modes of learning that simply sitting in front of a computer does not answer those. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Dr. Harris, I believe that an, an important piece to race relations is having a national teaching uh, campaign because we do not naturally get along. We have to be taught to get along and why we should get along. Mm. And therefore, I would like to see a structured program for race relations understanding, but also how the fundamentals of how we get along the fundamentals of why we don't get along. And some just like government programs that say, you have to have a driver's license because of this, this, and this. Mm -hmm. Well, you have to have a nation that gets along because of this, this, this. Mm -hmm. And we're going to everybody, mandatory. We're not going to assume that you know anything. But we're going to put together a program based on love, respect, and do no harm. 
<clears throat> education. Wow. Okay. And you know, that goes back to the spiritual principle of the golden rule. And, and I think that's why this whole spiritual and religious thing is so intertwined because what you were just sharing, Addie, that's the golden rule. You know, it, it's very funny you were saying when you were talking, I know when I was a child, we had white and black people living in the same neighborhood and we could all play together until we were about 10 years old. And then all of a sudden, one day the black, the white kid came over and said, I can't play with you anymore because you're a Negro. We weren't black, man, we were Negroes. And it was shocking, but it was learned behavior. And so this uh, national training teaching campaign of, and I think we, it's this learned behavior, we've learned that the racist behavior, we have to unlearn it and replace it with something else. So thank you so much for that, Andy. And potentially we could call it the solving the race issue curriculum. Mm -hmm. Solving the race issue curriculum. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Miss Sandra was telling when she was, she grew up in the woods, she grew up on the tobacco fields and you had the white and the black kids. And all of a sudden one day they got to a point where they couldn't uh, play together anymore. Miss Sandra, maybe you want to share that. Yes, uh, we lived on the farm and we had a, a white farm family who lived across the road from us. And I had eight brothers, a large family. We lived on a 500 acre farm. So back then there were big or uh, huge families, I would say. And when my neighbor became 10 years of age, who was a Caucasian boy, he refused to play with my brothers anymore because someone, as Herbert stated, told him that you can't play with Negro kids. And he stopped playing with us. And we were no more than uh, across the lawn. And uh, their house was, we could see them sitting on the front porch. But this racism, I've always said, is a learned behavior. When a child learns to hate someone, someone has taught this child to hate a Negro or to hate a dog or to hate a cat. So uh, I have found that it's a learned behavior from adults teaching their children. And I'm old enough to realize that this is behavior being taught by parents. Yeah. If you look at the, if you even think about the Rwanda um, genocide, it could be your next door neighbor. Sometimes it's not white on black crime. It was the black neighbors, with the black neighbors, right, the Hutus and the Tutsis were living, this was when Bill Clinton was a uh, president, and the, the Rwanda genocide took place. But and when a, leader, not, when a leader- Black on black, that's tribe on tribe. It's tribe on tribe, but I'm saying it wasn't color related. It was more that it was a leader saying that the people, you know, were less than human and didn't deserve right. to live. And I think that the, the answer, it's differences. It's like whatever's different, you know, and when we talked last week about the whole idea of making of a slave, and I think that applies in many levels, that one of the things that in making a slave, you want to make sure to create differences between light skin and dark skin, between young and old, between male and female, between tribe and tribe, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> between city and country. So anytime you create differences, what about Cain and Abel? If you go back to the Bible, mm, yeah, you know, uh, Cain and Good Abel. Good example. Mm -hmm. If you if you think of our Bible stories, they're not just history stories. They kind of foretell the the archetype of the human being, if you will. Yes, yes. And that's what I meant about understanding the fundamentals. Yeah. That I don't believe that we have a race problem in America. We have an ethnic problem in America that says we are going to support our group no matter what. And our group is more important than your group. <laughs> and therefore, when we look at group behavior, group allegiance, then it be, can be a tribe, it can be your caste, 
it doesn't have to come down to the color of your skin. Mm -hmm. Because what we know is that race is just a concept anyway. Mm -hmm. It's a construct. Mm -hmm. And therefore, there's no such thing as a race. It is about ethnic relationships and support of my group over your group. Mm. Very good. Mm. Yeah, that's deep. If I may offer, I think that that's true. Mm -hmm. And I think that there are additional layers to consider as well. Yes. And mm -hmm. those additional layers uh, do have to do specifically with, you know, with race. So yes. it's, it's ethnic groups and it's race, and it's quite a complex ball of wax. Mm -hmm. And the unique thing about America, you know, with all of its ills, is this notion of from many, there is one, e pluribus unum. The, the reality is that there are various ethnic groups that exist in America. There are various, mm -hmm. we would call them uh, racial makeup groups, religious groups, various ideological groups. And the notion is that even though historically it's been problematic, that we're marching toward this more perfect union. Mm -hmm. And I think we're at one of those spikes in the, in the you know, kind of chart of either we can spike up and make this a more perfect union exponentially, mm -hmm. or we're gonna spike down and make this less of a more perfect union exponentially. Mm -hmm. And I think that the work we're doing here speaks to doing the hard work, coming to the understandings and the agreements and the tensions that we can do the, the work that makes us a more perfect union exponentially through this tumultuous time in our history. Mm, very good. Well, I wonder yes, if the I, environmental changes that we're living through will help level the playing field any. And I say that because I think about the fires in California. Doesn't matter whether you were living in a shack, a tent, or a castle, yeah. it got burned down. And you exactly. would have to start from scratch. Yeah. So how do we create spaces where there is space for everybody? Who do we have leading the charge to put in place community patterns that would allow for everybody to be able to feed, clothe, and house themselves, which means that you have to have some kind of skills to be able to do it. Mm -hmm. um, can I brag on our, our city? Since we're a super uh you know uh diverse we started uh we just i guess it, we're behind the times a long way but um we just started a uh, uh an office of diversity inclusion and uh and equity diversity equity and inclusion mm -hmm. and um and it's uh it's looking like we're we're going to be changing that uh, that whole Michigas um, as we as we move forward. Wow, that's a great one! Diversity, equity, and inclusion. Well, folks, I wanted to say this: we're at nine twenty-one. I want to honor our time, and I tell you, when we get together, we have so much fun. You know, it's like a party; nobody wants to go home. <laughs> you know. <laughs> But I want to throw this out, that this completes this cycle. And when we talk about where do we go from here, I want us to look at the areas of business, government, and religion. Okay. And what I'm, what I'm thinking is that we've all had such a, a, an organic time together that I would love it, I think, if we could put together, if we could put our heads together and come up with, look at those three areas and write down ways you think that we can, things we think we can do. Like when I heard the, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, that hit me, that's gotta be a part of whatever it is. Cause if you don't get the truth, you will never reconcile, <laughs> okay? <laughs> and so to look at those areas and have us each start to pick an area that you, you feel if you want to work on the, the religious aspect, what can we do in the religious community 
to move to the next step, to, to bring about a more perfect understanding, to get people on the same page, to, to teach people how to live the golden rule, to look at the government area. You know, like right now we're right in the middle of the government issue. And so it may be to just need to get out and vote and send money to people you believe in, <laughs> okay? Uh, but the things that we can do in the government area and then look at the business area. What, what can we do to begin to bring about, <laughs> yes, thank you. What can we do to bring about this, this next evolution, this change? And my thoughts were that what we've done so far is just sort of feel one another out and get some insight. And the one thing I realized is we have a really special group of people. And so my thought is that just looking at these areas, it, in my mind, I had this idea that we come out with a 12-step a program of some sort, addressing these different areas in some kind of way. Mm -hmm. But to have us start thinking about it and writing about it and start posting it on our Solving the Race Issue in America movement page. I think all of you have joined that page. It's a private page, so it's just us and the people we let in. And start writing it up and putting that together. Maybe it's not a 12-step program. Maybe it's a 10-step program. But to start looking at least at those three areas of, and think of ways you think we can go forward together to the next level. I would love to have us continue this dialogue uh, at least on a monthly basis, but so that we can recapture capture this energy and move forward. I had a, a few thoughts in mind that we do a, a, a next meeting that we do on the second Wednesday in October. I don't know the exact date on that, the second Wednesday, two Wednesdays, the second Wednesday in October. And when we come back together with the idea of really sharing some of the writings that we put on our movement page, but really coming back with the idea, let's put together some type of writing. You know, the Declaration of Independence was important because it was in writing. The scripture says, write the vision, make it plain upon tablets. And that we start putting something in writing. And so we can set up a meeting and I'll set it up straight through Zoom so we don't go through all the complicated stuff with the, uh, with the, uh, with the uh, the event bright, but to look at when we come back together to make that happen, and to in the meantime to put um, your thoughts on our page and invite people you think who would like who would compliment what we're doing invite them to join the page. So I had a couple of things. Number one, to have people join our solving the race issue in America page to encourage others to join, share your thoughts, share your writings. Okay. Uh, number two, that I think everybody here has really made a personal commitment. Just being here <laughs> says that you're committed. <laughs> okay. A personal commitment to, to begin to speak up, not to argue with people, but to, to begin to speak up. And the Bible says, let them hear who will hear. <laughs> so, because there are many people out there who are hungry for what you all know, what you all have experienced, mm -hmm. the historical point of view, the psychological point of view, the religious point of view. There's so many people that, that are hungry for it and to make a personal commitment to speak up and share. Third, to at least do a mastermind, uh, I don't like the term, but a once a month meeting and, and a Zoom meeting where we keep moving this program forward with next one being the second Wednesday in October. And with the idea of coming back then and looking at a 12 step or a 10 step or whatever your thoughts are, this has got to be organic. I'm not, you know, like I, I'm just, the mastermind principle says when two or more gather on one accord, I am among them. And the I am power is a whole lot smarter than me or any of us individually. And that, and that fourth piece really to help develop that 12, some written document that says, this is what we can do to begin to solve the racism in America. Any thoughts on that? Does that sound like something we can do? Sounds wonderful, Dr. Harris. And I also let Ms. Moore know that this group, 
I text her as we were talking, would like to be involved with the Tulsa project of Wall Street. And Beautiful. she was so excited. So if, if somehow we can, maybe this group also wants to help with that project. We would love to. I know I would. Everybody's pretty much together on that. <laughs> okay. It's Dr. a great Roger. group of people that got the Cornell, Tulsa project. Got Cornell West and, and Reverend. It's a whole amazing group of people that's building that uh, Black Wall Street from 1921. Then. So if that would be something that I would feel honored to connect you to the group. Yeah. Dr. Rogers, I put my address in the chat area for you. Okay, um, Dr. Harris, if you can help me, I don't, I'm not yeah, sure. I'll, I'll, I'll get it to everybody. Okay. Yeah, I'll get it, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I'm not that good at this either, okay. All right, folks, so we're in accord with that. That sounds Thank like a good so thing much. going forward. I just love your energy. You just have this positive energy that makes everybody feel comfortable to communicate and and I think uh, this is this is what can you imagine what America would be like if they had these kind of groups all over? It would be Ooh. something, you know. It gives you a chill. <laughs> all right, folks. Anything else we need to say or share before we do our one word sign off? What was your takeaway from these four experiences? Maybe one word won't be enough. Maybe just go around quickly and your takeaway. Dr. Rogers, anything I need to cover? I think you've done a wonderful job, Dr. Harris. Thank you. Well, I'm going to start off. My takeaway is that there, whatever you seek, you will find. That there's a beautiful group of people that we reached out to find them, and you all showed up. And I'm honored that you did and looking forward to work with you. Other takeaways? I'll, I'll speak. I, I'm just very humbled to be part of this group. And um, I, I'm just sitting, I'm listening mostly because I don't think I can top anything that's being said. Uh, this group has such uh, intellect and passion and uh, I, I'm, I'm not even sure I should be part of it because it's such a terrific group. I'm not sure what I, what I can offer, but I'm just kind of waiting to see where I can jump in. So I'm listening. Thank you, Debbie. Thank you. Their behavior regarding ethnicity. Someone's reading. <laughs> Is that you, Miss Sandra? Go ahead, Miss Sandra. As a, as a retired educator, I was just thinking about educating the general public by way of government or whatever method we might be able to implement to change the behavior of the entire nation regarding, and I'm going to use uh, not race, the, the word that the previous speaker used, uh, ethnicity, because unless we are taught to change our behavior and read about the behaviors of other races slash groups, then we will not be able to understand why people do what they do. All right, thank you. Great point. Wow. Great point. Thank you very much. My takeaway, always seeking truth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you so much, Addy. Yes. Any others? For me, this has uh, been a very educational exercise. Um, I st personally, I have to still read the, the book, Solving the Race Issue in America. That's most of the way through it. That's, yeah. uh, it's on my list. Okay. I've um, already read How to Be an Anti-Racist. Yeah. I've also read um, An Indigenous People's History of the United States. Um, I'm still doing a lot of learning, uh, but, um, and I also, to, um, I have to agree with uh, Debbie Smith. I, I feel very humbled to be part of this group. Well, we sure appreciate you both, Rob and Pat. We really appreciate you. Yeah, I, and I think, I'll tag on to what he said, but I think these, these small group discussions are probably a really, I get, you can't get everybody engaged in them, but I find for me that it's, 
more enlightening than if I were to be sitting in a lecture hall or watching a webinar or something like True. that. Um, it, it's just, it's more personal. Um, and I think it means a lot more and it, it maybe helps us all learn a lot Thank better. You. Thank you so much. You know, Susan, as you were saying that, can you imagine when all of us do, if each one of us has a group like this, that would be 12 by 12, one was that 144, <laughs> and it grows and grows and grows. So I think that's where we're heading. So thank you Exponential. so much. Exponential. Yes. I've yes. been sitting thinking about the value of cross generations and how important it is to have conversations like this with really young people, mm -hmm. with people who are our age and really old people. Mm. My sense is that we will create a tapestry that makes it possible for folks of all ages to get educated, to be able to adjust behaviors. Huh? Right. Mm. I went to a Black Lives Matter protest. Well, it wasn't a protest. It was to almost like a memorial for a young fellow who was killed here in Wilmington this afternoon. And even though I owned a Black Lives Matter t-shirt, I didn't wear it because I didn't want to be targeted by somebody who might be one of those people wearing a gun. Well, mm -hmm. as fate would have it, there were probably 15 of us. And out of the 15, there were five white men and their sons who had on Black Lives Matter t-shirts. Wow. And so I have been pondering what it's like to have these conversations and to have it affect our children, our neighbors, sure. and to have the courage to just be very open in sharing. Mm. I mean, wise in terms of knowing when and how, but to be courageous enough to have the conversations. Wow. Woo. Okay. Any other? <laughs> I have to change me. Okay. Have we covered everybody who wanted to share? Okay, then, folks, it has been my honor to be here. I will uh, set up the Zoom for um, the second Wednesday in October. Please, if you have not joined, go to our Facebook, Solving the Race Issue in America Movement. Write comments. You'll see the videos of each one of our discussions. Share your thoughts and invite other people to, to join so we can grow this thing. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Dr. Harris. All Thank right. Have a good two Thanks. weeks, everybody. Enjoy right. the beautiful full moon. Yes. <laughs> have a great, magnificent day, always knowing that the best, the best is yet to come. Come. <laughs>